Hey everyone, how's it going? Happy Friday and welcome to our program on the birds of Claro County Park and the Oak Woodlands, part of POST's online event series. My name is Mark Medeiros and I'm the community engagement manager at POST. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the native peoples whose territories we are joining from. I'm in downtown San Jose, which could be described as historically part of Tamian Ohlone territory. But here in the South San Francisco Bay Area region, there are many native tribes and communities. Uh, I'd also like to mention current day. Uh, we have the Moekma Ohlone tribe and the Amamutsun tribal band who are generally um, the major tribes that uh, the the South Bay um, uh, has here. So I want to encourage everybody to think about the native tribes that are in your area um, and support your native tribes who have always been here and are still here. Uh, next, of course, we're facing some really difficult situations and crises across the state with multiple wildfires impacting the Santa Cruz Mountains the Diablo Range, uh, the Sonoma and Napa areas and beyond. Uh, so many people are impacted. We wanna thank all the heroic firefighters, first responders, all the park agency staff across all park agencies and all the community members who are working as hard as they can right now. Uh, our hearts go out to all the people and all the living beings affected. And of course at Post, um, so much of the land that we've protected is affected, our partners, the farmers that we work with, and um, we are intensely thinking about all this right now, as all of you are. Um, so everybody's wondering how they could help. Um, one big way to help is to um, just shelter in place. If you're not in an evacuation area, stay home. Now's not a great time to for outdoor recreation. Um, with the air quality the way it is and with the need for roads um, and, and park staff to be available for um, first response, um, especially on the coast. So um, definitely if you're in um, the Santa Clara Valley on the peninsula, um, probably not a great weekend to visit the coast. Um, so we wanted to share that. <clears throat> and we're gonna be sharing some links in um, in chat uh, for places you could find some more information um, about the fires, um, places that, as we understand it, are the most um, uh, the most accurate sources of information. So there you have it. Sorry for stumbling a little bit there, but you know we're all affected by this, and I'm glad we could be in community uh, together. Um, and enjoy some programming that might help us take our minds off of everything for an hour. So um, first I wanted to say a little bit about Peninsula Open Space Trust. For those of you who are less familiar with POST, we've helped to protect almost 80,000 acres of land in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Northern Santa Cruz counties since our founding in 1977. Of course, this is thanks to thousands of people who are part of POST donor community. So I want to thank you all uh, from the bottom of our hearts for being a part of this community, for listening today and for making this work possible. Thank you so much. Um, and next I wanna mention Santa Clara County Parks, a close partner of POSTS. Their mission is to provide, protect and preserve regional parklands for the enjoyment, education and inspiration of this and future generations. The best way to share what's coming up at County Parks is to visit their homepage, parkhere.org. They have their own uh, online events. Some of them are very interesting. I wanna mention that on August 26th, they have an event called Fire as a Land Steward, which will be discussing the use of fire um, and controlled burning to minimize the likelihood of catastrophic wildfires like we're having right now um, and for habitat restoration and maintenance. They also have a great program on woodpeckers coming up. Um, 
So thank you. And of course, Santa Clara County Parks, they manage Calero County Park and uh, the Rancho San Vicente edition. And that's what we'll be talking about today with our wonderful guest, Jeff Kaplan, who many of you have heard before. We're happy to welcome Jeff back. He is a bird language instructor that weaves 30 years as a naturalist and a teacher of communication skills to cultivate a common language for connecting more deeply with nature and birds. He inspires youth science educators in Yosemite, tour guides in the Galapagos, and university students in the Amazon jungles of Ecuador. He weaves mindfulness, citizen science, and bird language to help people from diverse backgrounds feel curious and connected in nature. For more info on Jeff's future workshops, please go to commonlanguagenature.com. With that, I'd like to welcome Jeff to the program. Hey, good to see everybody. Thanks for coming out on a Friday. Good to see you, Mark. Hey, good to see you too, Jeff. I know you're in Santa Cruz, in Santa Cruz but you're safe, so that's good. Yep, we're just, uh, you know, me and all the birds are here and we're looking at the sky. Uh, we actually had ash fall like snow uh, about two days ago, but that stopped. Uh, there's still uh, smoke in the sky and, you know, I think it's affecting everybody, but we're very positive and knowing that uh, this is a cycle, a natural cycle that things go through, living things go through, humans and non-living things, so uh, non-human things. So, yeah, we're, we're making it through. Well, great. Well, thanks for, uh, like I said, bringing something for all of us to enjoy today and to learn from. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go into it. Last last time we visited Bear Creek Redwoods. That was a very popular program. Today mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about Claro County Park, a little different uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in both of our uh, home area where we grew up, actually. So so I'm very excited to, to learn from you. Great. Well, um, yeah, let's get started. So uh, here we go. Welcome, everybody. We're going to be talking today about birds of Calero County Park and Oak Woodlands. And this is in South San Jose. Uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, both he and I went to school there. I used to run cross country on an easy day. The coach would say, OK, everybody, run 10 miles down to Calero and back. And we're like, thank you so much. That's so much easier than running the laps. So uh, glad to be back there. And uh, just some amazing things that you'll be seeing and learning about oaks and what lives there. Uh, I also just want to thank so many people who have volunteered both with the county parks and with post to take care of the land, you know, because this is really what helps it grow and helps more people be able to have access. So thank you to all the volunteers. And I want to acknowledge that I'm going to keep this presentation kind of playful. It's going to be a lot of humor and little mind tr tricks, mnemonics for remembering, because I'll be honest, it's hard to remember all the birds, and we have a lot of young people who we want to bring into interest for birds and protecting nature. And so, yeah, this is going to be a little bit playful, a little bit silly, and uh, hopefully we can just really broaden out the generations of people who are involved in connecting with birds. My name again is Jeff Kaplan, and I'm the director of the Common Language Program, and my goals are helping people with connecting, respecting, and protecting all living things. But right now I'm really interested in birds in particular. Excuse me, is, is that a picture of me? Because uh, 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 that's not my best profile. Oh, hi, Perry, everybody. This is my uh, my friend, uh, Perry, the peregrine falcon. Yeah, um, excuse me, uh, that, you know, where are the birds? Okay, we're gonna get to them, but we'll talk to you later, Perry. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that, he's often jumping in. So um, I also want to express my gratitude for tremendous diversity of humans who are helping out the birds. This particular person is in Ecuador, a place that I like to go every year and do community service. And this is a small owl that he rescued from some dogs that were harassing it and uh, brought it back to health by feeding it uh, raw chicken and talking to a, 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 a veterinarian and just really uh, doing whatever it needed to take. And, you know, there's a huge diversity of people. And that's something that I'm going to celebrate today as well. Huge diversity of people who we want to connect with nature and honor. Uh, traditional birding, everybody used to look like me, you know, a white older male. And uh, really, if we're going to protect the birds and take care, we need to increase our team to all kinds of people. 
And Dr. Drew Lanham talked about this. He's a professor in Clemson College back east. He said, you know, I'm the only black person when I go out birding. And um, I just want to say, let's make nature and birding a welcoming place for everyone. And so with a number of the birds that I introduced today, I'm going to celebrate different communities who I want to thank for supporting the birds. So you'll see a mix of different things today, not just birds. And this is what we're calling new birding. It's really reaching out and broadening and expanding and, and welcoming everyone to feel safe and included. Um, and again, I wanna help people from all different backgrounds connect, respect, and protect the birds. So today's workshop, here's what we're gonna do. First of all, we're gonna discover some of the birds of the oak woodlands, just a really unique habitat. Uh, we're also gonna discover some of the plants that they depend on for food. So uh, if you uh, are interested in birds and botany, we're gonna throw some plants in there too. Uh, next, we're gonna play Name That Tune because you know it is hard to remember a lot of the birds, especially when you can't see them, but you can hear them more often than you can see them. So if I can help you remember some of these birds by Name That Tune, uh, by listening to their sounds, then that will help you, you know, just learn a few. And if you are somebody who knows all the names of the birds, you might pass some of these along. Now, these are my own personal tips, my own personal ways of remembering them. I encourage you to share in the chat or send us an email about what are ways that you remember the names of these birds. And then there's the times where you just can't remember the name of the bird, but you want to know what's going on. And this is what's called bird language. Without knowing the name of the bird, you can understand what the birds are saying. So I'm gonna teach you some basic bird language today. You know, bird language is kind of like listening to somebody speaking a foreign language where you can't understand the words, but you can figure out what's going on. Today, I'm gonna to teach you how to know when birds are flirting and when they're just contact calling each other, you know, kind of like tweeting, short little message. Are you okay? Are we out here? Are we leaving now? Are, are, is anybody out there? This is all bird language. Now, I'm only gonna do two, and there are five different voices in bird language. So if you wanna learn more bird language, I would invite you to join me in my backyard bird language class. I'll tell you more about that towards the end. And if you want a complete list of all 97 birds that are here at Calero, then head on over to commonlanguagenature.com and you can click and download a list. Uh, I put it together with all the pictures of the birds and with their names. And then, of course, uh, for the birds that I taught you tricks for remembering, I included those in the notes too. So just really a good way to get started. Okay, and I think the most important thing about starting out with the birds is starting out with the oaks because the oaks are providing the homes for the birds. So here's a reflection on the oaks. And these oaks are here at Calero, but they may also be in your neighborhood. So here's a, a blog post by Matt Dolkas, who's a content manager at Post, and he says, uh, to me, there's something special about native California oaks, the big gnarly ones with thick bark and drooping branches. You know the trees I'm talking about? They're ones that stop you in your track, in your tracks, forcing that involuntary mouth gazing upward stare. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So we're gonna be weaving in and out of those oaks today and looking for some of the birds and plants and different things that are there. And I have to say that oaks remind me of gathering together. Why? Because of the acorns. You know, I just met with some of my housemates the other day and we went out and picked pears, in the giant pear tree that we have. And then we baked a bunch of pies. And gathering food together and turning it into something edible is really an amazing family thing to do. Um, so acorns were the exact same thing for many thousands of years for uh, indigenous and native peoples here in the valley. You know, it takes a lot of steps to go out, collect the acorns, grind them up, uh, wash them in the creek and remove the tannin and just really make them edible. And so acorns um, bring people together and they bring animals together. Matt goes on in his uh, blog, the acorns of California native oaks were the staple food for Ohlone peoples. And they actively managed the landscape to ensure the abundance of this crop. You know, they would have, uh, like um, we talked about in the introduction, small fires that would actually refertilize the land and that were able to be managed. So acorns have been life giving for many thousands of years. And they also provide homes for the birds and the animals. And in particular, this one bird that we're gonna be talking about a lot today, this acorn woodpecker. 
So here are a couple other plants before we go into all the birds that eat them and how to remember them. This one is called curly dock. If you look closely, you can see the curly leaves that come out from this plant. The second thing you'll notice is that it turns red in the late summer and fall, you know, kind of like a red cross. Uh, and it actually is a doctor. It can actually be used as a medical treatment for stinging nettle if you crush up the leaves and rub it on the part where you got stung or an insect bite. So I'm gonna make a cartoon out of it and I'll do this with a lot of the things I teach you today just to remember, because I'm a visual learner. Curly doc, again, it's that red plant that's got the curly leaves and yes, in addition to being a something you can put on bites and stings, it also provides a lot of seeds. You can see all those seeds for different plants and animals and birds. Okay, here's the next plant that you will see so much of. And this is actually not a native plant of California. Uh, we had native bunch grasses, but when agriculture dug up the roots of our native bunch grasses, this European grass really took over. And when people from outside of California think of California, they think of the golden rolling hills. Personally, each one of these seeds looks like a Japanese fish kite, if you've ever seen those. But the golden rolling hills is one of the icons of California, and this is wild oats, Avena fatua. So a lot of different insects and things eat these seeds, grass seeds. And in particular, there's a bird, not a very common bird, Vox's swift, but there is a bird that will be eating the insects. Now, this grass is not only popular with Vox's swift, but it's very popular with a different kind of swift. Uh, what swift am I talking about? Well, you may not realize it, but she gave this grass 7 million views recently on her video. Uh-huh. It's Of course, I'm talking about Taylor Swift. I, I don't know why the entire video is just showing this grass, but she's really into it. And what's the title of the video? August. Are we in the right place at the right time? I think so. Thank you, Taylor. All right, so moving on. You can go watch the video on your own. Another plant that is very popular among the birds is elderberry. Now it turns out elderberry is also very popular among humans who use it for tea, liqueur, syrup, you know, elderberry lozenges for your throat, things like that. They even claim that Harry Potter's elder wand was made from this plant. I'm not sure, but you could go research that. In any case, you can see the berries which are out right now. So if you do it sometime in the near future, go to Claro, keep an eye out. Normally you see the white flowers, which are food for a long time, but these elderberries, they are super food. You can see this bicyclist has even dressed up just to you know match with the elderberries. Okay, now we get to poison oak. And you know, most people, really hate this plant. You know, the twig, the leaves, the berries, everything. They're like, ah, but the truth is most animals are not allergic to this. In fact, they eat it. Poison oak berries are one of the main protectors of food source for many animals. In fact, it's the plant that the most different species of animals and birds eat in the oak woodlands. So when I teach this plant to uh, kids, I call it protector oak because it's really just the human beings that are not comfortable with it. It's a home, it's a food source. I mean, it's such a popular food source that it's like the go-to food source. I mean, if we were human beings, what would we call our go-to food source? Yeah, so I'm gonna rename it Pizza Oak because let's face it, it's got red and yellow, a little bit of green and everybody eats it all the time. Okay, just saying, you can call it whatever you want, but it is a very, very popular plant and uh, food source and the berries are available for a long part of the year and the leaves for all of the year. Now, where did I get this really wild and interesting information? Well, my coach is Kate Marion Child. Kate is a really amazing natural historian who went through her own journey to be able to learn about the oaks. And then she wrote this book, Secrets of the Oak Woodlands. I was talking to her and she revealed that she caught Lyme disease from a tick. Yeah, one of the uncurable, hardest diseases to deal with. And she said, I was so sick with Lyme disease that I couldn't work. She was kind of like shelter in place before we were all shelter in place. But I could wander, I could watch, I could wonder, and I could write down what I was seeing and hearing. And I did that for six years while I was being treated for Lyme disease. So 
that's amazing. Somebody who had the power and the insight to turn the shelter in place that her body was going through into finding information and riches and really slowing down and watching what's going on in nature. So thank you, Kate. And her book is really amazing. Every page I turn, I'm like, really? You're kidding me. Wow, I didn't know that. And these are all things that I'm going to be sharing with you, but that you wouldn't have known unless you took the time and did the research. And Kate did that. So I'm just going to encourage you to check out her book, consider buying it. Um, and if you do, you might want to go to katemarionchild.com. She told me something about the economics of the oak woodland as well that I didn't realize. This day and age, you know, I'm trying to support as many farmers as I can and local businesses. And uh, her book is $18. If you buy it from her website, which is up there and maybe in the link, um, she'll get $9, which she can put towards her medicine and towards her food. If you buy it on the internet, she'll get 90 cents. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, that's really new information. It kind of makes sense, but I wanna support her. So I'm buying my book directly from her. So just something interesting to think about the, the new economics and as we go through shelter in place, what's convenient and how can we support people who are doing good work. Thank you, Kate, I'm really grateful. And I know you're here watching today. Okay, so we are now in Calero County Park and of course parking lot, because that's where we're gonna start. And I have to say that Calero County Park is multimodal, which from transportation perspective means that there's a lot of different ways that different beings are getting around. There's wheels, there's a lot of wheels, bicycle wheels in particular. There's hooves, there's a lot of hooves. There's a lot of cows that are out grazing and they're really beautiful and non-threatening. And then there's shoes, that's what you and me are gonna be doing. So just wanted to be clear, we're gonna see a lot of different ways of different beings getting around. So, uh, here we go. Our walk is gonna start in the parking lot and we will pretty much uh, take a, go through a gate and then take a right turn and go up the trail. And then we'll take another right turn and we'll walk through some meadows and then eventually we'll get up to our first set of oak trees. So now on the way, there's a couple things you'll notice. The first one is mindful gate number one. I call it mindful gate for two reasons. Number one, because you gotta be mindful to close it and open it, but two, because it's got a lot of good advice about how to be respectful and how to take care of yourself and other people when you're walking out here. These are wide paths, but the encouragement is to wear a mask, especially when you're passing people or coming up to people, uh, keep your dog on a leash, things like that. So there's a lot of good information there. Okay, so we're heading out along the trail, bicycles are riding past, and the first thing that I see is a big rock. Now, I'll be honest, when I come out into nature, I'm often talking to a friend or thinking about the paperwork I have to finish. And, you know, I often just walk past these things, these big rocks. But right now, I'm kind of wondering, how did this giant rock get here? Was it the end of a, a glacier a long, long ago? And so what I'm gonna do is turn this first big rock into my grateful rock which means I'm gonna take a minute and just stare at it. And I invite you to all do the same. Take a deep breath and think about one thing that you're grateful for in your life. Think about that. Just come up with one or two things, go. Okay, if you wanna put it in the chat, you can. I have to say that um, I used to just walk in nature and really not pay that much attention to it. Like I said, I'd be talking to my friend or worrying about something. But when I stop and think about something I'm grateful for, what happens is the my body feels better. You know, it's like uh, I produce some good feelings and somehow the gratitude really just comes in and helps me feel more present. So I always look for something some place to stop. And we'll stop again one more time to dig into our gratitude and more awareness and presence of what's going on here at Calero. All right. And coming up, there'll be a gate. I call this grateful gate number two. Why is it grateful gate? Well, for one, the bicycle riders are really grateful if I hold it open for them because they just want to go zipping on through. So I do that. And then for two, uh, Many people will be grateful if I close the gate. Why? 
because if I close it, then there won't be cows wandering out into the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So, um, you know, this is a place where I, as a, uh, a person who's walking along, can really help out and keep the gates closed, and people are grateful. Okay, we're going to start hiking up the hill towards those uh, two oak trees in the distance. And, oh, whoa, that was fast. We got there quickly. Now, usually when I am on a hike, I want to power up that hill like this guy's doing. But this time, I just want to take a minute because I don't get out that much. And so I really want to take in the nature and the kind of healing properties that being out in nature can have. So I noticed this bench and it's right in front of some more big rocks underneath some oak trees. So I'm just going to stop for a minute and look at the rock and look at the bench and just kind of look all around to see where I am, where I've come from, where I'm headed. And I'd like you to take a minute and just notice what you notice. Okay, great. Just kind of a slow look around, taking a couple deep breaths in. You know, I really didn't hear many or any birds, uh, and I'm here to check out the birds. So I'm going to teach you this technique called deer ears that might help. So what you do is you put your two hands out, you know, cup them like that, and then pull them behind your ears and pull your ears forward and see if you can do that. And you might be able to hear my voice a little bit better. And um, hopefully uh, we'll hear more this time. So give it a listen. Let's try and listen. Well, that deer ears really works well. All right. So those are some of the birds that we're going to be learning the names of, uh, including that one that was going, shh, 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 shh. All right. So here's where our walk is going to go. We left the parking lot. We're going to head up the Lisa Killaw Trail. And Lisa Killaw was somebody who started out in the parks department just as a planner and then eventually worked long and hard and became the director of Santa Clara County Parks and Rec. And during her tenure, during the time that she worked, she expanded the trail system to 300 miles of trails in Santa Clara County. So we're here to honor her. She passed, and we're just here to honor her by walking on this trail that's named after her. When we get to Junction 33, there's a decision there, and I'll help you uh, make a choice. I made a choice to go to my left there, and so we'll be walking around kind of clockwise around that loop and then come on back. And I have to say, birds can definitely be hard to see. And more often than seeing them, we just hear them. So is it possible to identify birds by sound? You know, if you've tried that before, I know it's kind of hard. And for any of you who feel kind of uncomfortable with this idea, like I can totally understand. Because uh, it can be hard to, to remember that sound. What is it, you know, and who does it represent and stuff like that. And I have to say that I am not a bird expert. And you don't need to be a bird expert. I was actually a bug expert uh, when I was eight years old, uh, just to share a little bit of personal, running around chasing with a butterfly net, making bug collections and things like that. And then in college, I studied botany. So it's really just been within the last eight to 10 years that I've really gotten into birds. So you don't have to be a bird expert to be able to do the things I'm doing, which is remembering and learning birds by name and also connecting to birds through bird language, even when you don't know their name. So here we go. All right, let's listen to our first bird and see if we can identify it by sound. And so I'm gonna make up some little cartoons and some different uh, poems and ways for you to remember this bird, to kind of get it into your memory. This first bird looks a lot like a clown that's flying around. Now, uh, yes, it's got a red nose and the red wig and the eye paint, you know, the face paint and all that stuff. See if you can hear the sound of this bird and how it sounds like a clown laughing.
Okay. It definitely sounds like laughter to me. Might sound like something different to you, but again, these are my personal memory tricks and I encourage you to come up with some of your own if you want. And then I wrote myself a little poem so I could remember it. Wacka, 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 laughing up and down. The oak tree is my circus, my face painted like a clown. If you're a nickname heckler, now this is the bird talking, you might holler, he's a clowny woody pecker. But if you're a real bird name checker, then please cheer for a corn woodpecker. All right. And you can see it actually isn't a red nose. It's actually a brown acorn in its mouth. That's what it was. I love that <laughs> at the end. That's definitely a professional laugh. Okay. Uh, if you want to do this poem with me, feel free uh, to try and say it with me. I'm going to say it one more time. One, two, three. Wacka, wacka, wacka. Laughing up and down. The oak tree is my circus. My face painted like a clown. If you're a nickname heckler, you might holler, he's a clowny woody pecker. But if you're a real bird name checker, then please cheer for acorn woodpecker. Very good. A clown, acorn, you get the connection. All right. Anyway, that works for my brain. All right. Well, this will be on the test later on. So see if you can remember this bird by its sound. And you know, acorn woodpeckers are very interesting. They're polygenanderous. What does that mean? That means there's multiple males and multiple females and they're all married and committed to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know in the Bay Area, I've heard the word polyamorous, but this is about poly marriage. So they're really committed. Yeah. So what it means is there might be three males and two females or whatever mix. And they're the ones that are making the eggs, but they're part of community child rearing, which means all of the other acorn woodpeckers in the tribes go out and feed the baby birds, no matter whose babies they are. Uh, yeah, basically childcare. Uh, they're very aggressive when it comes to the bird feeder. And I watched just last week, the acorn woodpeckers dominating the bird feeder. You know, they'd eat and they wouldn't leave, but they're also very affectionate. And that means they'll all, you know, give each other a good night flutter, kind of like a good night hug, everybody, males, females, males, males, females, everybody. They're just like, good night, good night, good night, good night, uh, as, they, uh, as the sun goes down. So just really a very tight knit community and one that has a lot of social structures that take care of them. They also have personal structures that take care of them. And that is they have some overly controlling dynamics. They're often changing directives and directions. Basically, they're OCD, like me. What am I talking about? Well, I like to have everything ordered, you know, in the right place. Acorn woodpeckers are exactly the same as me. Why? Well, you can see this acorn woodpecker is putting a green acorn into a hole. And it, it's got to perfectly fit the hole so that the, wood, the acorn doesn't fall out. But guess what? The acorn is going to dry up. And so it's going to shrink. So these acorn woodpeckers are coming back all the time to every acorn and checking, is it still fit, fit good? Is it going to fall out? Do I need to move it? i got to move it over here. Oh, that doesn't look good. So if you're kind of OCD like me, then this might be your totem animal too, acorn woodpecker. And if you want to learn more about the secret life of acorn woodpeckers, you can go to the blog post by Matt Dolkus and uh, also, again, on the post website. And you might see that in the chat, uh, the link in the end or now. And uh, basically, Matt summarizes it and says, would you believe me if I told you that acorn woodpeckers get married, change their kids' diapers, use daycare, and can predict the weather? Wow. I don't even understand the part about the diapers and the weather. I'm going to go read that blog. All right. Well, let's move on to our next bird. And I want to celebrate our partnership with Latino Conservation and Latino Outdoors. And I've been a bilingual teacher for a long time and would lead bilingual family bird walks. And it was so great to uh, be on bird walks with the group Latino Outdoors. And basically, this is a group that says, you know what? We would like to see more Latino folks like us out in nature. And what can we do to help people feel more connected? and more safe and just, you know, get out more. So this next bird actually has a scientific name which ends in Mexicana, Cialia Mexicana, kind of like Cialito, Lindo Mexicana. 
Uh, Cialia mexicana was named mexicana because the first bird that was cataloged was in Mexico, and there's huge numbers of these birds in Mexico, and some in California and different places in the United States, uh, Azulero. And so I'm going to be teaching you this bird because I had a great conversation with my housemate Alfredo and how this bird reminds him of his culture and his family. Uh, now, first off, a lot of times birds are looking for a mate. And if you look at this profile photo, if you know what I mean, uh, this photo is not that impressive. How could this bird look more impressive? Uh, you know, there is Snapchat. Uh, for birds, you know, like the filters, uh, they call it bird chat, I assume. Uh, you could put on this filter. Is that going to work? I don't think that's going to find him a mate. But actually, these birds do use a special kind of filter that makes them more attractive. Their wings have keratin in them, have structures in them that reflect blue light when they're in the sunlight. Now, the feathers aren't blue. When this bird goes into the shade, it doesn't look blue. It looks brownish gray. But when it pops out into the sun, their feathers refract the light, kind of like filtering it, and make it look blue. This is interesting. All this is going to go into my poem. So this is what that same bird looks like in the sunlight. Yeah, this, this really wasn't going to work so well. The second thing, and Alfredo and I were talking about this, I said, you know, I grew up in a family uh, where one of the goals was to be successful and move away from your family. And that was my Jewish middle class family from Los Angeles. And he said, you know, that's interesting because in my family, I went to college also, but then I came back and live near my family. You know, and uh, this is just part of what we do in our family. We, we have our success, but we move back and we stay close. And I said, you know, that's the same thing that this bird does. Because many bird species, once they have their kids and their kids hatch out of the nest and begin to fly and go past being fledglings and become adults, the parents will chase them away. Because why? Well, uh, you know, this is my territory. This is where I got my food and I'm just about to raise more babies. Not so with this particular bird. This particular bird will come back, even as an adult, when it's having its own kids and it will find food for its younger brothers and sisters, the new generation of eggs that its parents are hatching. So familia, la familia es todo really is what this bird is doing. This kind of bird uniquely sticks together and generation after generation feeds the family and takes care. The last thing that I'm gonna say, and I'll be teaching most of you uh, how to learn bird songs in English, but this one is gonna be in Spanish because you know a lot of the things here. Uh, remind me of my Spanish-speaking friends and their families. So, if you don't know Spanish, I'm going to teach you some right now. Oye, we. Everybody repeat that. Oye, we. One more time. Oye, we. And it's written out here, oye. And then the G, the U with the two dots over it, makes a wa sound. And the translation of that is, hey there, dude. All right, one more time. Oye, we. We. All right. Now listen to this bird sing and see if you can pick up on the Spanish translation of Hey There Dude. Oh yeah, way, way. Oh yeah, way, way. Oh yeah, way, way. Okay, I know that's a stretch, but this is really what reminds me of this bird. So here's the poem that I wrote. And if it's not a stretch for you and Spanish is good and easy for you, that's great. I have to point out though, that for my Ecuadorian friends, this is not, they didn't understand it because everybody in different countries speaks Spanish a little bit differently. So this is Mexican Spanish. Oye, oh, yeah, we. Salia Mexicana is my name. La familia es todo is my game. Oye, oh, yeah, we, we is my song you heard. With my flashing blue feathers, I'm the Western blue bird. And again, this is the species that was first named in Mexico and is all over the western half of our country. And um, now when I hear it, I'm like, okay, I think I can figure out that that's that bird singing, oh yeah, way, way. Oh, there we go. Let's listen to it one more time and see if you can pick that up. And by the way, saying, oye, oh, yeah, way, 
to some of your friends who speak Spanish will work as well. Okay, now the Western Bluebird. Just so many amazing things about this bird uh, that I read from uh, Kate's book. They definitely family and keep their family together. They have prismatic feathers. Uh, but unfortunately, they have been doing a battle with the starling to find places for housing. And the starling, the European starling, uh, came in and just really ran them out of town. And so there were a lot of places where there used to be bluebirds and there aren't anymore. So about 10 to 15 years ago, people in British Columbia and now in the Santa Cruz Mountains have started putting up housing specifically for the size of the Western Bluebird. Now, Western Bluebirds usually would just live inside of knot holes uh, that were created by woodpeckers in oak trees and other trees. So, you know, there's not that much housing. In fact, I was just reading that some of them will come back to our area in February and they're not even going to make babies until April, but they know there's just not a lot of holes in trees that they're going to be able to use to raise their young because that they got to live inside, nest inside the trees. So what people have been doing and successfully is building bird boxes with the right sized hole that lets the Western bluebird in, but keeps the starling and other uh, birds out. So that's something if you want to take care of the birds, you might consider putting out some nest boxes and you can go online and read what size and how to make them. And I'm sure this bird is very grateful and we're seeing many more uh, Western bluebirds these days. So thank you to everyone who's done that work. Okay, moving on. We're gonna learn this next bird by sound. And um, you can hear, and you can see this person is using her deer ears. And I was kind of thinking about, okay, who do I want to dedicate this next bird and sound to? And so I'm going to dedicate it to two famous women. Uh, and also, uh, interestingly enough, gender diversity is celebrated. Uh, these are two famous women who worked for many years to make it legal for them to get married. And uh, yeah, they're famous uh, and I think they're cool, but they're also, they're also my two moms. So why do I bring this up? Well, a couple reasons. For one thing, uh, in addition to their activism, I have to report that when I was growing up, when they met in the 70s, they could not talk about the fact that they were in love. Uh, you know, it was one of those shh uh, things. Yeah, shh, shh, shh. Why? Well, back in those days, if you uh, were a lesbian, uh, you could lose custody of your kids. Yeah, crazy, but that's the truth. And you couldn't get married, in fact, until not too long ago. So I just want to thank them for the work that they did. And this shh is what reminds me in my mind of this next bird. So I want to celebrate all kinds of diversity. Uh, there's a feminist birding club in New York that's going to different places. And I want to thank my two moms for getting me out uh, into nature and learning about the birds. So here's this bird. And let's see if you can hear this shh, shh. And then I'll tell you what the shh, shh is related to. Okay. Yeah, no, they're not shushing my mom. But here goes. Here's the poem I wrote. I am queen of the oaks with my gray mohawk. They do have mohawks. Very shy and polite. Never curse when I talk. Tiny and sexy, but outside of the house, I'll shush you down if you catcall. Hey, oak, shh, mouse. I think you're getting the idea here. So what's your name, young and gray? In a whisper, I'll say, I'm oak tit mouse. Shh, 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 shh. Now, why? Why do these birds make this sound of shing? Well, for them, they're making it as an alarm, either defense uh, or aggression, or to say, hey, there's a hawk coming. But I have heard people do the shh because when I work with middle school students, they don't want to say that one word in the middle. Yep, tit. Now, I can totally understand that. They want to be polite. Uh, but I'd be working with them. I'd say, oh, okay, so you guys, do you guys see that oak tit mouse up in the uh, in the tree there? And one of them would say, yeah, that, uh, that gray bird, the oak. Um, why? Because in American culture, the word tit is, you know, it's about sexy things and they're, they're embarrassed. They don't want to talk about it. But in English culture, 
where the name of the bird came from, tit just means a small thing, and a titmouse is a small bird, Ooh, kind of like a mouse. So, you know, this is one of those cross-cultural things where we need to uh, respect that everybody has different needs and different things that embarrass them, and the middle school students certainly felt embarrassed. So I let them call it Oak Mouse if they want, and that way they can remember what the name is. So here's the poem. If you want to say it with me, you're welcome to. Oops. Uh, okay, and this, uh, here we go. I'm queen of the oaks with my gray mohawk. Very shy and polite. Don't curse when I talk. Tiny and sexy, but outside of the house. I'll shush you down if you catcall. Oak, shh, mouse. Then what's your name, young and gray? Proudly, I'll say, I'm oak, tit, mouse. Shh, shh, shh. Everybody try that? Shh, 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 shh. Okay. Now, this bird does a lot more than just that alarm. In fact, it does some singing, and I'll talk to you about that. But why does this oak titmouse have such a raspy voice? Here's a theory. It eats seeds and bugs, but sometimes it finds more fascinating things. Once more in slow mo. Okay, so that's why I, as a birder, am committed to picking up garbage. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want that oak titmouse to have a raspy voice from smoking, from picking up cigarettes. Yeah, I never knew that birds did that, but they do. And I try to keep a plastic bag in my back left pocket. And whenever I find garbage, when I'm out walking in nature, I'll put it there and throw it away. Because let's face it, they don't know what it is. And they pick it up. All right. Now, Oak titmice, which is the plural of titmouse, oak titmice sing for almost everything. First of all, if two males are fighting against each other, there's the one, like this one here, who owns the territory, and then another challenger will come in, and the challenger will sing a song. And to defend the territory, this male will sing the exact same song back. And then the challenger will sing a different song, more complex, and this one will sing that song back. In other words, it's called matched counter singing. It's kind of like a form of capping or, uh, you know, challenge each other by making different songs up and seeing who's the best. And the point is, the owner of the territory often will win by being the smartest musician, the ability to sing the best. So if you ever hear this matched countersinking, I think you're in for something kind of like Hamilton. All right. Second thing that's happening is that when these males bring food home, they have a special song that they will sing, which is, honey, I'm home. And I'm bringing some food. Yeah, pizza from the pizza oak berries. Something like that. So really amazing. The babies are taught how to fake snake hiss. So when they're inside their nest, if something's threatening, they will hiss as if they're a snake and scare that predator away. I'll be honest, it's such a small and gray bird, but it's called the heart and soul of the oak woodland. So I'd encourage you to keep an eye out and an ear out for the oak titmouse next time you're in the oaks. Today's episode of Birds of Calero County Park is brought to you by NCIS, Nature Crime Investigation Science. Who was the murder birder? I found this feather on the ground. Clearly it came from somebody who got eaten for dinner. I looked at the base of the feather and noticed that it was broken off. I bent down. I looked around. I found another feather. Who made this break? Now, there are three different kinds of predators in the woods. If it was a wolf, then the feather probably would have been sheared off at the base because wolves, sorry, coyote or a fox, because the fox in particular has serrated teeth, very sharp, like a pair of scissors, and can just cut the feathers off at the base, not a fox. If it was a bobcat or some other kind of cat, then the feathers would have just been plucked out because they'll just grab a mouthful of feathers and pull it off. And as you can imagine, like many of the food that we're getting from the store these days that's wrapped in packaging, birds are also wrapped in packaging called feathers. In any case, that's not what's looking, this feather's looking like. Something broke this feather as part of plucking it out. Now, what animal would be using something to break the feather? Hmm. Our science investigators determined that this animal has a tool that's made of bilabial, extruded, agile keratin, kind of like a needle nose pliers. Who could that have been? Oh, by the way, the short abbreviation for that is beak. Yes, if you were thinking a hawk 
or something like that. Something that has to use its beak to pinch the feathers and break the feathers as it's trying to pull them out. Then you were correct. So here's the poem I wrote because I looked up and I saw a specific kind of raptor. Big hawk hovering like it was held on a string. Black eyes, golden beak, like the wintry king. Wings flapping and flashing white, black, and white. Beware the claws of, you got a guess? The white-tailed kite. Yes, indeed. And these are an amazing bird. You know, and I'm going to get more into the raptors when we come back to Calero for a raptor fest, probably in November. Uh, but this bird will hover in one place like it was on a kite string, and it's looking for its food. Just amazing. And, you know, it's a big white bird. It really stands out in the sky. Now, next NCIS question, who was invited to dinner by the white-tailed kite? Got a guess? Looking at that feather? Give you a hint. We saw this character before. And I have to say, yeah, you might feel sad that somebody was invited to dinner and didn't get to eat. But let's face it, all of the birds need to feed all of their babies. And so this bird was probably fed to the kite's babies. Yeah. That's probably who it was. All right. Moment of silence. Moving on. All right. Now we're going to do our next bird by sound. And this one is a little bit of a repeat bird, meaning if you came to my last talk on birds of Bear Creek Redwoods, then you learned this one already. And... Uh, Let's see if you can remember. If you didn't come to that one, don't worry. I'll teach it to you right now because this bird is very easy to identify because it sounds like it's wearing high-topped tennis shoes. Yeah, and squeaking its toes on the gym floor. Hmm. Have you ever heard that squeak, squeak, squeak? Have you ever played basketball and heard your own feet going squeak, squeak, squeak? Okay, well, who is that? Let's listen to it one time and see if you can hear the sound. Okay, can you connect that sound with those tennis shoes? Great, who's wearing them? It's the California Toey. And the poem is short and sweet and squeak. California Toey squeaks her toes on the gym floor wherever she goes. Pretty much a brown bird, not shy. You'll see her on the ground a lot, picking away at the seeds. Sometimes you'll see a little orange under her chin and her gym shorts will often be orange. And this is one of the most common birds that you see and that I teach about because it's just so uh, so wonderful to watch. And it lets you know if there's danger because it'll go beyond the squeak. Okay, we're gonna do one more bird by sound. And I wanna relate this bird to some of my older adult friends because I'll be honest, as I get older, my hearing gets less good. It's hard for me to hear. And in addition to that, it's hard for me to understand. And there was a time in my life in particular where I really had a hard time understanding and that was when I was listening to my voicemail. Now, do any of you, no matter what your age is, ever have a hard time with your voicemail? Excuse me, what, like, what did that person say? In the old days, for you millennials, we had these things called answering machines that had a cassette tape in them. And so you'd listen and somebody would leave you an important message that would sound like, okay? And you'd be like, what did they say? Oh, I get so frustrated. So then we'd have to rewind the cassette and that would be fast rewind until we heard the beep. And maybe if we missed all three messages, we'd rewind past three beeps to hear all three messages. So here's the sound that I would hear often. Okay, that's me. And I would get a little red face because I was frustrated. You know, just have to admit technology. Well, Turns out there's a bird that reminds me of that exact moment in my life. And this is that bird back at its house, checking its voicemail and wondering, what did it say? Listen to this bird singing right now. Does that sound, does that sound like me checking my voicemail? Wait, is this bird checking? And it's got a cassette, an old fashioned one. How old is this bird? Okay, so here's the poem. Back at my house, checking my voicemail. This is the bird talking. What'd you say in your message? It's so hard to tell. Fast forward, rewind. It's never a cinch. 
I get so frustrated. I'm the red faced. You want to put it in there? What do you think? Yep. House Finch. Okay. Now, listen to me checking my voicemail. And then this bird singing back at its house. Okay, hopefully you can connect those two. And the house finch is also an amazing bird, also very old school. You know, it's one of the most common birds in all of the United States. I, I used to be bored of it, but then when I looked into it, there's some really interesting facts. It used to be just a West Coast bird, well, kind of like me, I was born on the West Coast. Then somebody took it to the East Coast. Well, that's what happened to me, I got taken to New York. And these birds got released from a pet store and they spread out through the east as well. So now they're all over the country. It's kind of like what happened to me. California, New York, then I just started traveling all over the country. Uh, this is primarily a vegetarian family. Yep, I, I went through that too. Uh, because they feed their young instead of insects, which is what most birds feed their young, they feed them mostly seeds. And you can see those big pincher beaks. In Spanish, it's called pinzon, means like pliers. And they're just great at cracking the seeds. Now. In terms of old, yes, they do grow to 9 to 11 years, which is a long time for some birds. So you might see the same birds for 11 years back at your uh, bird feeder if you got one. And talking about old school, these birds go back to the Pleistocene. Like there are fossils of these birds around when other dinosaurs were around. So, yeah, they probably did have a cassette answering machine. Okay, you get the message. Okay, it's time to play Match that sorry name that tune by matching the bird sounds Are you guys ready okay so you can put in the chat which bird sound do you think i'm playing and this is all going to be based on your memory and the cartoons and the poems that bridge here's contestant number one can you name that bird tune Okay, if you guess, number three, acorn woodpecker, you are correct. All right, let's try this one. Okay, what do you think? If you guessed back at my house, checking my voicemails, you are correct, that is house finch. All right. Got two more. Here we go. Okay, if you guessed Oye Way, Western Bluebird, you are correct. All right, let's do this last one. Got it? If you guessed oak shh, mouse, then you've got that one as well. And you know, there are a couple more. And if you want to learn these, I encourage you to head back to my last class, which is on birds of the Bear Creek Redwoods, and you'll be able to learn all of these four. And if again, if you want to see all the birds listed out, and then I've also included those mnemonics, those memory devices, that we, I just taught you, I included them on this page as well. So you can help you remember some of the birds we learned today and in my last class. Now, I have to say, sometimes I can't figure out that bird by its song. And I used to feel inadequate, you know, like, ah, I can't figure it out, I must be dumb. Uh, you never feel that way? All right. Well, you're not dumb. It's hard, there's a lot to do, but I can figure out what the birds are saying. And that's actually an interesting thing, bird language, actually for me is more interesting than just naming the bird. So I'm gonna take you into a little bit of bird language because not knowing the name of the bird keeps me focused on that bird for longer and my curiosity keeps growing. So here's a little bit of bird language of the oak woodlands. And bird language is a bridge. It helps people who don't have bird books 
uh, or a biologist or binoculars to tell them what that bird is to stay connected. And we're talking about all the birds. They all speak their own individual language, but they understand a common language so they can respond to alarms. They can respond to flirting and fighting and things like that. So that's what this bird language is. I'm gonna teach it to you in a way that lots of people can understand through emojis, okay? Bird language through emoji, doesn't matter what language you speak, you'll get the emoji. Here it goes. And we are at junction 33. So we are gonna turn up the Lisa Killa Trail. And as we're turning, I heard this bird. Okay, now you may not know the name of that bird, that's okay, but what was it saying? First of all, what it was using was a song. Now you might think, isn't everything a song, Jeff? No, actually, there are five different things that birds say and song is just one of them. So you might not have, how can you tell it's a song? Well, first of all, it has different notes. It has a melody and it repeats. Second thing is that uh, as you listen, you get a sense of, oh, there's something that it's saying and it's saying a specific thing. So I'll tell you about what that is. Now you may never see that that's the robin who's singing it. Maybe it's hidden in the grass or in a tree, but you will get that that's a song. What does a song mean? Three different things. The first thing is, hey, uh, excuse me, I'm looking for a mate and maybe you should choose me. You know, I'm, I'm a good one, swipe right. Okay, good. The second one is, this is my territory. If you wanna fly through, that's fine but I'm in charge of the berries here. You know, don't be eating my goji berries. And third of all, and this is not scientifically provable, but a lot of people believe the bird is singing because it's happy. I mean, can you tell that your dog is happy? Is it possible a bird could be happy? All right. So we're gonna walk by down the trail past this oak tree. And I just wanna acknowledge we're going a little bit longer, but uh, there's a lot that we've been talking about today from the fire to all the bird learning. So if you need to go, you can definitely watch this recording. And if you wanna stay, then I'm gonna keep teaching you a little bit more bird language. So we're walking along past this oak tree and listen to this and tell me, is this a song? Okay, what do you think? Was that a song? You wanna say in the chat, yes or no? Okay, the answer is yes, that was a song. And you may never see the Buick's Wren that sang that song, but you can tell from the different notes and the repetition that it was a song. Melody, repeats, means these three different things. Pretty cool. Um, now, another thing that you'll notice as you're walking through uh, this land because there are so many birds and you'll see some bird boxes and uh, it'd be interesting. I don't know yet whose bird boxes those are, but what about the cows? Well, yeah, the cows are kind of too. Well, I want to change the name of this place from Calero to Cowlero. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's so many cows and they're so beautiful. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting, Perry. Uh, maybe we'll talk to the park rangers and, or, or we could change it to Bike Lero, you know, because there's so many bikes. Well, you know, that's true. If you come to Cow Laro, Bike Laro, Calero, you might want to come on off hours, meaning not on the weekend, because a lot of people love to ride their bikes here, unless you're on a bike. Uh, I did notice that there are people wearing masks, and that's a great way to be respectful to the people that you're riding past. Um, yeah, definitely masks, mm -hmm. uh, Bike Laro. Okay, well, thank you. So we're hiking down the hill. And I heard this, and I just want to ask you, is this a song? Because now you know what a song is. Okay, so that is not a song. You didn't hear a lot of different notes. It was short and simple. You might never see the ruby crowned kinglet right there with the red hair, who's kind of sounds like he's typing his uh, memoirs on a type old fashioned typewriter. 
but you will definitely be able to tell that's not a song. So what is it? It's called a contact call. Contact calls are very important, possibly the most important, because it's birds checking in with each other to say, hey, are we here? Are we okay? Are we staying? Is anybody out there? I need to know. Are you looking out for me? They're simpler than songs, but they do repeat. So take a listen on this serpentine rock and see if you can hear. Serpentine is that really cool green rock. And see if you can hear this next one and tell me, is this a song or a contact call? Okay, now, and you know who this bird is, who's climbing around on this beautiful green rock. Yeah, not a song, definitely Toey. Okay, again, contact calls are short, they're simple, they're like tweets, they're checking in, only 144 characters, I think, max. Oh, it's up now? All right, but you get the idea. Okay, well, congratulations, we made it back to the bench, and the bench is in the shade now, and you can just relax sit in the shade, tune into bird language, and just listen. You know, I taught you the first two lessons of learning bird language. If you want to learn more bird language, for example, uh, you know, is there a nest in that bush? What, did they build a nest on my front door? Then that's something I can teach you. If you want to know that there's a hawk alarming because crows are attacking it or other birds are alarming because there's a hawk coming into your backyard, or if you want to be able to just listen and hear, whoa, there are two people, two males fighting over a uh, mate. Or if you want to learn some female bird language, because there is female bird language as well, then I invite you to come to my next class. It's called Backyard Bird Language, starting on September 8th. There's four sessions. And basically, we'll focus on your birds, your home, your story. And it's a small group, so we can really get into your details. So you can just head on over to commonlanguagenature.com. And again, if you want that list, feel free to head over to the same website and download it. If you go to Calero, I would encourage you to do some things to be respectful of yourself and the other people who are there, which is bring a mask and, you know, put it on. If you don't want to keep it on the whole time when you're passing people, definitely that's what I do. I put it on. So in today's workshop, we discovered the birds and the botany of the oak woodlands. We identified a bunch of different birds just by their sounds and songs. And those were my personal stories. I encourage you to come up with your own personal ones or use mine because really we're all gonna be able to learn the birds in our own way. And uh, please email me and share what you figured out. What's a good way for you to remember that bird. We learned some introduction to bird language and um, you know, depending on how much time Mark wants to stay, we can answer some questions. But most of all, I just wanna thank you all for enjoying the birds and beauty of Calero County Park and Oak Woodlands. And if you wanna support any of these groups, donation's a great way to do it. Uh, I know my work's been cut and I know that the other groups have all been looking for funding. I just was able to donate to a post for a program they had. So uh, yeah, feel free to make donations to support the work that we're all doing. Okay, so Mark, uh, what's your thoughts now? Do we wanna go into questions or we wanna respect people's time? What's, what's the best way to go? Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, first off, that was that was wonderful. Um, as usual, people are just having a really good time in, in chat. I know um, personally, the Western Bluebird, it's just a bird I've seen for so long. That was so cool. I, I had no context on, you know, their their behavior and and all that stuff. So so thank you. Yeah, so I think we'll just take a couple of quick questions here. Great. Um, that came up and and first i wanted to address one that uh that somebody threw out about are there ways to help um the wildlife that are being affected by the wildfires right now um you know so i i think it's it's worth mentioning some of the organizations in our area that are working on that um and my colleague katie will post links in chat there I wanted to call out the Wildlife Center of Silicon Valley, the Wildlife Education and Rehabilitation Center located in Morgan Hill and Native Animal Rescue of Santa Cruz County. Um, those are all organizations doing work. I'm sure that they're incredibly swamped right now, um, but I would monitor their website and their social media and see if there's any ways you could help there. Um, I've definitely seen some pictures of, of the, the birds and other animals that are being rescued right now. So. 
wanted to share that one. Um, I see an, I see one specific question here about the red um, house finch. Um, the red color, is that on males and females or one or the other? Jeff? Yeah, good question. So the red color on the house finch is something that the male, just the male, develops in the spring. And it's related, not like the bluebird, which is reflecting, refracting light, it's related to food that it eats. And so it brings in pigment through red food that it, it brings in. And that red color goes away, you know, later on when it's not the mating season. So uh, when they first come uh, to my bird feeders, uh, earlier on in the year, they're all brown, they're both brown, and then the, the red develops. And uh, there's some evidence that the more red the bird is, the better a mate, better luck it'll have at attracting a mate. So yeah, definitely style is really important here. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I thought that that was one specific one that I I saw in chat. I'm not seeing too many others right now, so I think we're just gonna stop there for today. That was that was incredible, um, as usual. And thank you everybody for joining us, um, getting your mind off of things for a second. And of course, please stay safe out there. Um, do what you can to support um, your community, your neighbors. Um, and we wish you the best, everybody who's affected right now. Um, yeah. I, I want to say also, if people enjoyed this, keep an eye out. Come back to Post's website because we're planning another session about an birds of another place. And uh, you'll have to come back to the Post website to find out where we're all headed. But it's definitely going to be fun, funny, and uh, be talking about what we can do to learn and take care of, connect, respect, and protect all these birds. Wonderful, Jeff. Yeah, um, a couple of things. Yeah, definitely. We we um, flashed our uh, event page on the screen a second ago. Um, OpenSpaceTrust.org/events. We have several things coming up there, um, including Jeff. More uh, more of Jeff. Um, and of course, if you are not yet a donor to Post. Um, we encourage you to make a donation if you're inspired. You know, a large part of Calero was originally protected by Post, namely Rancho San Vicente, um, and then adjacent parks like Rancho Canada del Oro, um, Sierra areas of Sierra Azul. So, um, thank you for considering that, and to all of you who are already our donors, um, we appreciate you so much. Um, and lastly, I want to mention in chat we posted a survey for this session. So if you're willing to take that, um, we'd love your feedback. Um, and with that, Jeff, uh, thanks again for today. And we look forward to having you back soon. Great. Be safe, everybody. All right. See you, everyone. Bye-bye.